welcome one and all, short and tall and everyone in between to the sixth and last and final one of these Imagining the Future interviews uh, as part of the Scottish Institute for Enterprises Festival for Innovation, of Innovation. Uh, and in case anyone's not joined us before, hello, I'm uh, Quentin Cooper, your genial host. Uh, but much more important in these things is our guest, the person I'm going to be having the innovation conversation with, someone who's going to give you tales to inspire, tales to intrigue, and hopefully tales to encourage you to send in some questions and comments, which we'll have time for at the end. Today, that con uh, conversation with a bonus bit of conservation is with Isaac. Tunjai, uh, co-founder of the uh, Baobab-based beverage Behemoth Drink Biotic. I hope you like that bit of alliteration. Uh, Aizatu, uh, where are you? Uh, welcome, and uh, where are you talking to us from? Well, I'm talking to you from Bothwell today. From where? Bothwell. Ah, right. I can okay. never That's ever good. pronounce this properly, but hopefully I got that right. <laughs> I think it will make sense. Now, now, disappointingly, if we were doing this face to face, I'm hoping you'd have brought in a delicious uh, drink for me of your own. Since yeah. we can't do it that way, can you at least run me through um, what, it, what it is, what it's made from, what it tastes like? Bearing in mind, obviously, you'll be prone to marketing it as well. Yes, of course. So currently we have three Biobat flavours. A ginger and lime and uh, orange version as well as mango and passion fruit so they all have a little bit of a tang to them that comes from the baobab and and as well as some very nice tropical flavors coming from the passion fruit and mango and I'm guessing baotic is the name because it comes from baobab but also uh, biotic that's right that's right so baobab for the bio and the tick really is a play on words from the prebiotic side of it. Yeah. So baobab has a natural prebiotic element. Because this is particularly targeted at the growing kind of gut health market. That's right, exactly. So the gut health market has seen tremendous growth and think from us understanding our microbiome a lot more, the importance of fibers, as well as the linkage now that research is established to our brains even and into our mental health. So, yeah. And did nobody say, are you sure you want to have a product whose name rhymes with chaotic? <laughs> Not exactly, no. I think many people always pick up from the fact of the play on words from the bio uh, biobab and the prebiotic. But I like that chaotic, <laughs> chaotic version of it. So it's worth a little a little detour for those who are unfamiliar with the baobab. And I'm, I'm no expert, but it's, but it's, but it's worth saying how important and revered it is across much of Africa, known as the upside down tree in some places, but more, more perhaps more importantly, is the tree of life. That's right, yeah. So Baobab, I grew up uh, near lots of Baobab trees in the Gambia. It's a very old ancient tree that grows all across Africa, 33 countries in general. And it's seen as a symbol of uh, wisdom, knowledge, and a lot of inspirations where elders say a lot of stories, folk tales under the baobab trees to children. And our, like these trees grow to a, a, a huge age, don't they? Some of them are right. literally thousands of years old. Very, very old trees. So they're mostly carbon dated because they don't have the sort of like tree lining that, that you can't count the age. So they're carbon dated. Yeah. Now you mentioned you grew up in a village in the Gambia and I think you're 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 way inland way east aren't you of Banjul you're about as far inland as you can get in the in the Gambia and how how much was how much was this part of everyday life I mean is, uh, just to give us a sense is a baobab if you have a baobab fruit is that a treat or is it something that's like oh gosh not baobab again <laughs> kind of not baobab again sort of there is it's a lot but I guess the different ways we consume it creates that, uh, still retains that fun part of it. So growing up, my grandmother would put it into um, a porridge, a traditional porridge in the morning uh, called mono. My mother obviously sold it in the local market. So would make you put it in an ice block because Gambia is very hot. So people really enjoy that when the sun is boiling. And then you have it into lollipops. In modern Gambia, it is something that everyone will have in a ceremony, be it a wedding ceremony, a naming ceremony, they always is biobab juice available to serve around. So it's clearly not an original idea to have baobab as a drink. You say even your mother sold baobab drinks, but your idea was to try and turn it into something that could be marketed to the, to the gut health market. 
Most definitely. And I, I think and in the way then that's done. So the Gambian versions are very different to what we, we do here. I think the health focus part of it, not putting too much sugar, etc. And the innovation pipeline we have come to. Um, there used to be a traditional thing about baobab, drank mostly in the morning, children are weaned on it. And if you have a stomach ache, you tell any other person in the village, they will say take baobab. <laughs> but there wasn't any solid research to actually say why that was the case. And I think coming to the UK and for the last few years, we've gone back to actually understand those traditional and cultural beliefs and then work back on literature reviews and researches within universities to actually pinpoint the reasons for that. So it's the way actually a lot of Western medicine, if you like, has worked in recent years, is rather than poo-pooing folk remedies around the world, they've gone off to where it might be the Gambia, it might be Thailand, it might be Vietnam, and asked people, what are you using as traditional remedies, and then gone to find out if there's actually any sound medical stuff behind them. Yes, most definitely. So a professor from King's College London uh, called Tim Spector in 2016 um, traveled to one of the last living hunter-gatherers in the world in East Africa to actually look at why their microbiome were one of the most advanced in the world. And he realized Baobab was one of the main stable ingredients in their diet. You consuming their diets for 12 days means that his microbiome grew 12, uh, 20%, sorry, approached the average uh, British people, person, sorry. So yes, most definitely, I think it's taking that step back to actually say, why did we always do it this way? And how can science give us a validation on some things like that? Okay, so we've established the health credentials of the Baobab and the popularity and the reverence of the Baobab. Now we need to get to why you and why in Scotland, because you, you did well at school and then you applied successfully for a place at Glasgow Caledonian University. Yes, so <laughs> why me and why Scotland? So when I went to my agent in the Gambia looking at university and she asked me what I wanted out of um, the university or the surroundings and areas, I said I wanted to go to somewhere that is really nice. And she said, okay, there's so many places you can find out. What else? I said, well, I've never seen the snow before. And she said, Glasgow is the best place to go to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, in uh, uh, Caledonian University was uh, viewed as one of the best universities in the world to study risk management. And hence why I went there. And Baobab came at the third year of my university when I was studying innovation models and entrepreneurship, uh, reading about Richard Branson and Brewdog. And yeah, I got really inspired. Before that though, 10 years before that, Paul and I, my partner who started the business, always wanted to bring Baobab. We, we kind of smuggled it into China when we lived there <laughs> um, because we couldn't buy it there. And while we were enjoying it, we said, you know, this is something we definitely need to bring into the UK. So it's one of those things that you always say you want it to do and there is no perfect time to do it and you just have to jump in at some point. And I'm going to jump in at this point for two little footnotes. One, I'm sure the University of the Highlands and Islands and probably Dundee and probably Stirling are all going to say they're better for snow than Glasgow. Glasgow is the place <laughs> if you want rain. And secondly, this podcast does not in any way advocate smuggling things into China. This is not a good idea. <laughs> So you're, you're there, you're on the course, and I think, you know, it's even as you're on the course, you begin to actually go, you know, go from having this as an idea to executing it. So what were the, what were the first tentative steps? Well, very first tentative steps. My, um, there was a lecturer that taught us a lesson in innovation models, and I spoke to him briefly about the idea and I tried to convince him to let me do it as my fourth year dissertation. And you can imagine I was studying cybersecurity and risk management and I was speaking to RBS at that time to, to do an internship and a case study and suddenly I wanted to do <laughs> my, my, intern, uh, my dissertation on Baobab. So it kind of was in a fit but he encouraged me a lot to look out at accelerators and uh, incubators. And at that time, I joined the RBS um, accelerator in the city center. And really, that's, that was where the first step started. I started applying for grants to help me validate the product in itself, because at that time, I only had the liquid in 
an empty 250 mil bottle. So, so those grants went through and I worked with the university to start validating the liquid itself in terms of what ingredients and compositions I can put together. At that very start, we were very clear on wanting to keep the product clean and inclusive. And I guess that's probably came, uh, was inspired by my experiences and so, some sad experiences from the Gambia and our whole journey about supporting female cooperatives and wanting to make health at the center of everything that we do. You don't seem to have suffered from what a lot of would-be entrepreneurs and never quite startups suffer from, which is that they will have a good idea and they will think there's a gap in the market, but they don't necessarily believe that they are the right person to do it. You know, given, given how popular this fruit is in Africa, you know, were you surprised to find, A, this hadn't done before? And were you surprised to find how confident you were that you were the right person, this student, this undergraduate, to actually do this? Oh, that's a, that's a difficult question. I, I am not still sure I'm the right person to do it. I have a passion to take it to a place where I know that probably only I can do that with the experiences I have from the Gambia and the, the journey I have come through in life from my upbringing and my background to date, I, I know there needs to be a core mission of, because of the way Biobab is sourced. I don't think you can just do it in a less fair way and succeed in it. Coming into the UK, there were some biobab products available, but they were using an extract and I didn't feel like it really paid homage to the nutritional benefits of it or to the people that actually sourced it. So I think that passion, it's probably why at this time, at this point in time, I do believe that I can take it to a stage where I can bring people in, definitely. And did you convince yourself you were in the right place because it's a slightly spooky coincidence you you arrived in glasgow when 2013 yes now i don't know if you know this but in 2014 so did a baobab because the artist robert coyer sculpted a baobab tree as part of the stuff around the 2014 uh, commonwealth games in glasgow so in uh, out in tolcross park they i don't know if you know this they built a fake wooden Baobab. So it seems like it was, it, was, it was in the air, it was in the ether to do something with Baobabs. Oh, that's incredible. I didn't know the year, actually, but I learned about the sculpture and I went to the park to see it. Unfortunately, I couldn't, but I was gutted that I couldn't see the sculpture. But I didn't know that was 2014. There you go, there you go. But I mean, what I'm, what I'm getting at though, although it's a joke, but obviously Glasgow, may, there's may, there may also be one in the Botanic Gardens, I don't know, but it's obviously not a place where you can source Baobabs very easily. So did, did it occur to you that maybe you would be better doing this, I don't know, back in the Gambia or somewhere else? Were you, were you sure this was the right place to be doing this? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think the sourcing of it, obviously where I am, the sourcing of it creates other geographical challenges. But I don't think in terms of starting a business as a young entrepreneur, as a graduate and as a female, actually, I think absolutely this is the best place to have started it. The amount of support and actually inspirations from the entrepreneurial community, organizations like the SIE and uh, my university, Caledonian University, I don't think I would have had that anywhere else in the world. And I, yeah, and I, I think all of those things coming together has helped to, to bring us where we are today. And I think anywhere I am, even in the Gambia, probably the challenge would have been how to access international markets. So I think there is going to always be a challenge, but most definitely my experiences from what I have in Scotland, I don't think I, I can I can beat that at all anywhere else in the world. Good. Well, as you say, you you, see, you started to pick up support quite rapidly. You started to pick up seed funding, uh, and you seem to make rapid. And then the next stage was you started to pick up awards, including I think one from Virgin Mobile, where as part of the prize you got to meet Richard Branson. That's right. Yes. Um, that was an amazing actually experience because I, I applied for the whole application and the whole pitching it was different rounds to it. Got to the big day to pitch and it turned out to be in George Square in the very open and everyone can hear you and see you. So I think the introvert in me got there and thought, oh my God, am I really going to have to do this? And, but I think it was an amazing opportunity and the whole experience that followed up from that in meeting Sir Richard Branson and Richard Reed from Innocent Drinks through that experience as well has been amazing. 
obviously meeting Richard Branson is one of those things. It sounds great and it looks good on your company website and things like that. But did you actually get anything from him that you thought, right, we can we can use this? Yes. <laughs> yes, we told him that we want him to come to the Gambia with us. And he said, yes, let me know. <laughs> 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 When you have, um, Rich, uh, sorry, Richard Branson is someone that's very passionate about human rights uh, challenges and issues and wants to get involved with things like that. And I think the discussion went down that route. That's something he'll be open to in the future if we, if we ever called on to him. But I think it's the whole other opportunities then it opens up. So that meeting, meeting him and then I was introduced to Richard Reed next to him who then introduced us to Innocent and there was a mentoring route from there. So yeah. I think it's sometimes it's what builds on what comes after that. Uh, sometimes it's, the, it's a big thing because he has to meet so many other people on the day as well. Okay, so talking of what comes after that, let's fast forward to where you're at now. What's, what are you immediately directing your energies towards? Now it is um, finishing, uh, launching the product and then pursuing some very strong international opportunities we currently have. So last year we went to a few trade shows in the United States where we've had some strong interest from two distributor programs, which will see us selling and entering about 1,200 stores uh, in the States, which is going to produce some very large volumes for us and the type of retail product we have that is essential for, for scale. Um, so very excited to be working on that opportunity. It takes a lot of <laughs> work in terms of getting all the accreditations, the FDA approvals and so on, but is the journey we're very excited to, to, to be embarking on. And I take it there isn't a limit in terms of the baobabs themselves. I mean, these trees are huge and old and ancient and but quite slow moving in some ways. You, you can definitely keep sourcing enough baobabs for global domination, can you? Most definitely. 32 countries in Africa it grows in. So Zimbabwe alone, they did a research in 2018 that shows about 4 million baobab trees alone in that country. So it is in abundance. And I think um, the World Economic Forum says if it's sourced properly, the baobab supply chain can bring about a million dollars, a billion dollars, sorry, each year to the African continent. So I think there is a huge opportunity not only to impact the lives of women that harvest it, but in uh, commercial terms, financial terms, a huge opportunity as well through that. Because it is worth stressing, this is an important part of what you do. You're always trying to kind of replenish roots in the community, give empowerment, give us greater strength to individual villages that are out there as well. This isn't just a kind of something you say, it's a commitment in the, in the structure of the company. Most definitely, yes. I think we have pledged about 10% of our profits going to, to these communities. And, and for us, it's because it came fast. It, supporting these communities is what we've been doing for 10 years before Biotic. It, it has to be something that is part of us and how the business grows. And we would want that to be more. It just depends on how we bring in shareholders and how we grow as a business. Now, you've come a long way in a relatively short time. Like you say, it's only, what, seven years since you first hoved into Scotland in the first place. Anything that really stands out from it? Anything you're particularly proud of in that journey? Oh, gosh. That's a difficult one. <laughs> I think it's it is the network and the people in business there is very some there's a lot of proud moments um so the feeling you get as a young graduate when you break through a certain challenge or milestone so for example for us securing Ocado and in the very very initial stages exporting to somewhere like UAE sorry mm. the United Arab Emirates that is a big milestone for us, but connecting to a network where people kind of believe in you and buy into your idea and help your personal development as well as the business grow, it is amazing. So my relationship with Glasgow Caledonian University and organizations like SIE, Scottish Edge, has been tremendous for my personal development, the opportunities I've had to learn and grow, uh, lessons learned throughout those journeys. And I think I could have only have done that with those people on those networks. So, yeah, whatever happens, if I leave in Scotland, I'll always leave with those memories and those, uh, and those feelings. Not that you're saying you're leaving Scotland at any point. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> and what about the flip side of that? Any moments of resilience where you, where you kind of nearly could have failed? 
Ah, uh, yes, uh, lots of them. <laughs> 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 lots of them. I, and I think that is probably the, the fun side of entrepreneurship. Not that you feel it like that when it's happening at that point in time, but it is. It, it does help you appreciate and be grateful for where you are and celebrate the successes because of those. So at the very, very initial stages of us actually trying to bring this product to market, it's almost like every single force is against you. Um, I remember particular stories where um, we, we go to farmer's markets. That's where we really started selling the drinks to validate it with customers. And once we turned up and the organizers have completely forgot to put gazebos up for us, but it has done it for every order, <laughs> every order retailer, uh, uh, seller there. And we were like, okay, we will just have to handle this the, the tough way. And five seconds later, the rain was hammering it down. And sometimes you get, <laughs> you know, our alternator one went off on the motorway once with 4,500 drinks that we had to sell at a mm. marathon event. And but that day was the best sleep I've had. We just put blankets down on the opposite field and just slept it off. So, yeah, so I think there are, and I think being a female and an African, uh, I think in sort of like this industry or in the sort of times we live in, it can be a bit harder sometimes trying to navigate both some personal challenges as well as some professional ones. But I think it's everything combined is what makes me who I am, I guess. I'm going to open it up for questions and comments in a moment. But for, before we do one absolute classic, anything, it's only been, if you like, a seven year journey, which is still remarkable. But anything you wish the you of now could have told the you of 2013, which would have helped you along the way? Oh, wow. That's a good one. I think I would say enjoy the moment and and celebrate the little the victories do you always know when it's a victory though <laughs> but that's the thing I, I think sometimes we forget how far we've come as people uh sometimes the focus is all on the business milestone but as individual we evolve with those business ideas and concepts and missions I, I think where I started, like, for example, our plastic pouch we, we started with has always been a big downer for me because I wanted to move into environmental packaging. Wow. And trying to innovate out of that was a big challenge. And sometimes I kind of wish that just being able to see that as a challenge and working towards it should be a relief of where I want to be rather than always putting that strain of when shall I launch the perfect package. I'll, I'll put you in touch with a friend of mine, Mark Miodovnik, who's an expert on plastic packaging and alternatives to it after this is over. OK, so as promised, uh, we're, while we've been chatting, your comments and questions have been flooding in. Well, I don't know. They might have been flooding in. They might have been trickling in. I frankly don't know. But I know who does know, which is Fiona Godsman, the chief executive of the Scottish Institute for Enterprise. Uh, Fiona, I hope you're going to cherry pick a couple of them for us. Absolutely, they have been flooding in. Uh, some of them have been answered in the conversation, actually. Um, but you're almost picking up on the last bit, talking about your own journey. Is there one thing in particular you maybe have learned about yourself in your journey? Or is it just more, is it been more of a journey of learning about yourself? <laughs> I think a lot, but there is something around resilience. Uh, I, I, sometimes when things are happening, I'm like, gosh, how did I actually ever think that I, was, I was going to get out of that? And maybe ability to problem solve, um, being resilient and problem solving, even if it's the smallest thing at a time to get out of that challenge, to, to, to be alive for the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, resilience is, is something that, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's shines through any of the successful entrepreneurs that we've seen absolutely mm -hmm. having that drive and resilience so important um there's actually a few around the products and distribution which i'll try and pull together a little bit mm -hmm. um initially in terms of the different elements of the product what did you you decide to focus on for marketing because it was obviously the gut health the heritage the alternative drink uh, mm -hmm. and who are you targeting Yes, that's a very good question. And I, I think it's a, for us because of our story and everything with the Biobab, it's always very difficult to nail down the focus points. But I think our, 
our journey in terms of from the farmer's market, the different or minimum viable product that we created without any sort of investment and backing to start with has helped us really create this engagement with the customer face-to-face -face events. We've traveled all across England to, and Scotland talking to customers and that really tr helps us um, summarize things about the product that we want to talk about, what we know is important to the customer. And I think that's what helped really nail down the marketing bit for us. It's a journey. We're still, we're still navigating this in a busy, distracted world. I think um, it is difficult to sometimes get through to the customer, but the mission is vital. Finding your core as a person and as a business, I think does help drive this as you grow. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. Um, I, you know, I think if you hold true to your mission, and perhaps it becomes a little easier to, to make the other decisions as you're going forward. Mm -hmm. There was a couple of questions around distribution, and, and in part you've covered that because you talked about farmers markets, but you've also talked about distributors in the US. So there's a vast gulf between the two of them. When you were starting out, um, how did you approach the distribution of your, of your product beyond testing it in farmers markets? Yeah, I think by the very nature of it, we were an international company because of the sourcing mechanisms that we had. So it wasn't just even sourcing from the Gambia, it was mostly throughout Africa, looking at the right um, suppliers and the people that had the right uh, structures and female cooperatives in place. And then being in Scotland, like you say, it was amazing in terms of the support that we have, but it was a premium health product and we knew it wasn't going to be the biggest market for us. So instantly from the very beginning was looking at who else or where else around the world that this appealed to. So from desktop research, from linking with Scottish in, uh, enterprise and their research services, looking at who are the main distributor channels across the US, who was a big gut, big gut health market, uh, places like Germany and the Netherlands came up high. So it is looking at the opportunity cost, right? The, the amount that we need to enter the market and the time that it was going to take versus how much actually we can make. And the US always came top of that. And I think sometimes taking opportunities as they come, right? So I had an opportunity out of the blue to go for a trade show in the US and I took it was the most craziest thing and went to this with this show. It is at, it's the most biggest trade show in the world and you can absolutely get lost, get lost in it. I was fortunate to come across um, the ex Whole Foods buyer, international buyer for Whole Foods for the whole of the States that absolutely fell in love with Biobab. So if I hadn't taken the opportunity, I would never met him, but meeting him probably absolute luck with everyone that's in that place. So yeah. Yeah, I hope like that answers your question about distribution. Yeah, it, it, it does really, and it just it, it, it's basically you're putting the customer first, and then working out the best channel to 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 reach these customers seems to be what you were saying. Um, two quick questions: one, are you planning more product lines, or simply a geographical ex expansion of your existing product? I think for now, we kind of going with focus. We kind of innovated to a point now where we can actually strategically put the product in different sectors and segments. So right now it's through uh, launching and trying to scale. Yeah. And, and the final killer question, there's really only one answer to that. I'm going to ask it anyway. Is having your life partner as your business colleague a good thing? <laughs> 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 I'm afraid there is no one quick should answer to that. I think it's a difficult one, but yes, it is just because we started as one of the best friends and we, we inspire each other. Uh, Paul's motivation to always do good and be the best version of himself as a learner and also to contribute in everything that he does to people around him has always inspired me as a person. So having us together always reminds, of, reminds me of why I'm doing things. So I think, yeah, in the midst of all the chaos and not being able to ever switch off from business, <laughs> that I think it's a godsend. Uh, that, I'm sure he's very pleased to hear that and I, I, and I guess it also just reflects the importance of being a team doesn't it um, in right. business as well yeah two heads is always better than one yeah yeah I think that's it for me <laughs>
Grand, and I, I, I very quickly, I have to sneak this in. You're, you're, the company you have together is, is Hippo and Hedgehog. Who's Hippo and who's Hedgehog and why? I was dreading this question. Ah. <laughs> uh, yes, I think I am the Hippo. Paul likes to think that, and he's the Hedgehog. Just plays on our multicultural story. Okay, there, there are so many other animals you could have gone for, but I like the fact you went for I Hippo. know. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure talking to us, but this is, I'm afraid, where we must end the uh, Bay of Babel. So thank you to Isati and Jai. And that is also, I'm afraid, with this short series of six, hopefully slightly inspirational, innovational uh, conversations uh, comes to a halt as well. Uh, we have not stopped imagining the future, but we hope this will help you continue to imagine the future in more and spectacular ways. And maybe we'll come back from some more another day. Uh, my deep thanks to the Scottish Institute for Enterprise for putting all this together and particularly to Raleigh, Scott and Fiona who you just heard from. Thank you to all the interviewees, thank you to yourselves for giving up a sliver of your free time to come and watch and now get back to whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, maybe only slightly more imaginatively. Ta-ra! <laughs>